Hello everyone. I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. I am the General Medicine Educator. In this session, I will just give you a quick recap of the topic on the diseases of the anterior pituitary. So first of all, you should be very much aware of the hormones which are being produced from the anterior pituitary. So that includes the growth hormone, adenocorticotrophic hormone that is ACTH, then prolactin, then we have luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, then we have TSH that is thyroid stimulating hormone. These are the hormones <coughs> which are being released from the anterior pituitary. So in this session basically I will be discussing about the tumors of the anterior pituitary that is we have what is called as the microadenomas and as well as the macroadenomas. What is the difference between these two? The difference between these two is mainly the size of the tumor. So if you take microadenomas, the size of the tumor is less than 1 centimeter, whereas macroadenomas, the size of the tumor is more than 1 centimeter. Clinically, how is it different? In case of microadenomas, you will have only endocrine manifestations, whereas in macroadenomas, along with the endocrine manifestations, you also have the mass effect on the surrounding structures. So if the size of the tumor is large, that can compress the optic chiasma and thereby the individual can have visual impairment. That will be the clinical difference of macroadenomas from the microadenomas. Now, if you see the various pituitary adenomas, the most common secretory pituitary adenoma that will be your prolactinoma. So, prolactinomas they constitute almost around 50 to 60 percentage of the pituitary adenomas. And the other types of the pituitary adenomas are the growth hormone secreting tumors that is somatotroph type of pituitary adenomas. Then we have ACTH secreting tumors and as well as the gonadotroph secreting tumors. So these are the various the anterior pituitary adenomas out of which please remember this point most common secretory pituitary adenoma will be prolactinoma. But again, if the question is asked as like, what is the most common pituitary adenoma, then the answer will be non-secretory adenoma. But if the question is asked as what is the most common secretory adenoma, then it will be your prolactinoma, right? Having said this, I'll just give you a clinical scenario. So I have a 32 year old woman, right? Seen a physician. Why? Because she has noticed milk like discharge from her breast from the past four weeks. She also states that she has not menstruated in two months. The examination reveals the galacturia but is otherwise normal. So the two important findings in the patient is one, no menstruation, two, milk secretion from the breast from the past four weeks. So these two important features in a 32 year old woman is very much suggestive of the prolactinoma or hyperprolactinemia, right? If you take an endocrine disorder, okay? Now, anyways, you have to differentiate the absence of menstruation and as well as the lactation from the other scenarios as well. I will be telling you that. But in this session, I'll be discussing about this hyperprolactinemia or prolactinoma in a nutshell. So, what is the common clinical problem with excess prolactin secretion? So let me tell you the common clinical problem with excess prolactin secretion is number one, there is excessive milk production that we call it as galacturia and there is absence of menstruation that we call it as the amenorrhea. So these are the common clinical problems in women with the excess prolactin secretion. Now, so there is absence of menstruation. Why there is amenorrhea in patients with hyperprolactinemia? Why? Because this excess prolactin, what it will do is it will inhibit the hypothalamic release of the GnRH, that is gonadotrophin releasing hormone. So when this excess prolactin inhibits the hypothalamic GnRH, there is no secretion of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. So subsequently when there is no FSH and LH secretion from anterior pituitary, there will be no menstruation. So that will lead to the amenorrhea. And next, the question is, what is the mechanism of prolactin causing infertility? So in patients with prolactinoma or hyperprolactinemia, you have the presence of infertility. Now the question is why? Because this excess prolactin, it will inhibit the LH surge. 
and this LH surge is the one which is responsible for the ovulation. So when there is no ovulation, definitely there will be infertility. So the mechanism of prolactin causing infertility is the prolactin inhibits the LH surge and thereby it will inhibit the ovulation. Then and the LH FSH producing cells are not destroyed, they are just suppressed by your prolactin. That's a very important point you need to know. And the next question is, is there hyperprolactinemia in men? Definitely yes. So there will be hyperprolactinemia in men as well. And what will be the presentation of the hyperprolactinemia in men? They can present in the form of gynecomastia and especially galacturia is very rare right in men the galacturia is very rare but they can present with gynecomastia so this will be the manifestations of hyperprolactinemia in men and the next question if you see what is the most common presenting symptom in men because of hyperprolactinemia see because of hyperprolactinemia the most common presenting symptom in men is the development of erectile dysfunction and there will be decreased libido as well. So erectile dysfunction and as well as the decreased libido. These are the most common presenting symptom in men. Then next question if you see what are the causes of hyperprolactinemia. So the causes for hyperprolactinemia if you see we have the physiological causes and then we have the pathological causes. So what are the physiological states or what are the physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia? The physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia it includes pregnancy, nipple stimulation, early nursing, exercise, sleep, stress. These are the physiological causes for hyperprolactinemia. Then followed by that what are the pathological causes for hyperplactinemia? See, pathological causes for hyperplactinemia, we have systemic causes. We have drugs causing hyperplactinemia. <clears throat> right? And apart from that, very, very important, we have certain tumors which will be causing hyperplactinemia. So, firstly, if you see the systemic causes, that includes cirrhosis of liver and as well as the chronic renal failure. See in chronic renal failure why there will be hyperprolactinemia is the prolactin after being metabolized in the liver it has to be excreted through the kidney and if there is chronic renal failure the prolactin gets accumulated within the body resulting in hyperprolactinemia and the other causes for hyperprolactinemia is hypoglycemia, seizures and tumors that is the prolactinoma. And the very important multiple cho choice question that you may be asked is what are the drugs which will cause the hyperprolactinemia? So you have to understand that the dopamine antagonists they are the one which will cause hyperprolactinemia whereas dopamine agonists they will reduce the prolactin level whereas dopamine antagonists they will increase the prolactin levels right. Now, what are those drugs? So, those drugs which has the inhibitory action of the dopamine. Example, we have the drugs that block the dopamine synthesis. And what are those drugs that block the dopamine synthesis? Phenothiazines and as well as the metaclopramide. Right? Phenothiazines, it is an antipsychotic drug and metaclopramide, it is an anti-emetic drug. And we have a dopamine depleting agents like alpha-methyldopa used in the treatment of Parkinsonism and as well as the reserpine. So, these are the drugs which will cause the hyperprolactinemia and apart from that tricyclic antidepressants, narcotics, cocaine, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, risperidone, all these can cause increase in the prolactin levels. So, these are the pathological causes for hyperprolactinemia and you have to know what are those tumors. One tumor I have said you that is prolactinomas will cause hyperprolactinemia but apart from that we have certain macro adenomas that will be obstructing the pituitary stalk right that will be obstructing the pituitary stalk and those tumors which will obstruct the pituitary stalk can increase the prolactin levels examples like macro adenomas that obstruct the pituitary stalk when they obstruct the pituitary stalk what happen 
the dopamine will not reach the anterior pituitary so the inhibitory action on the prolactin is lost and thereby there will be excessive prolactin secretion now what are those tumors those particular tumors they include craniopharyngioma meningioma and dysgerminoma empty cella and as well as the trauma so these are the tumors that will obstruct the pituitary stalk and will increase the prolactin secretion so how do macroadenomas cause hyperprolactinemia this is the mechanism so these macroadenomas they prevent the action of the dopamine from hypothalamus on the anterior pituitary and if you see the next question how does primary hypothyroidism it causes the hyperprolactinemia so whenever the individual is having primary hypothyroidism what will happen to your thyroid releasing hormone from hypothalamus it is increased so this excess trh that is being produced from the hypothalamus that will stimulate the prolactin production from the anterior pituitary and that is responsible for hyperprolactinemia in hypothyroidism and how will you diagnose that if you are suspecting primary hypothyroidism responsible for hyperprolactinemia simultaneously you also have to test for the tsh so when you test for the tsh if the tsh is also elevated then you have to suspect that the primary hypothyroidism is responsible for the development of hyperprolactinemia having said this what is the clinical presentation of prolactinoma in women just now we have discussed in hyperprolactinemia the same applies even for the prolactinomas as well see hyperprolactinemia they present with galactoria menstrual abnormalities in the form of amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea osteopenia and osteoporosis in long standing cases and apart from that the individual can also have infertility and gynecomastia in women so definitely in women you have the presence of the mammary gland but there will be increase in the size of the mammary gland and along with that there will be galactoria as well then let me tell you that if the prolactinomas are there in men and women the women they are detected earlier than compared to that of men why because the women are detected earlier because of the menstrual abnormalities so the menstrual abnormalities in the form of amenorrhea will make the female to present to the doctor wherein on workup you will be able to diagnose this hyperprolactinemia secondary to your prolactinoma so microadenomas are more common in women because they are detected earlier but whereas in men they are being detected later by the signs by the time the size of the tumor is increased where the individual will have where the males will have the macroadenomas next what is the clinical presentation of prolactinomas in men we have just discussed the features in hyperprolactinemia in men the same applies even in prolactinomas in men as well so men they present with the hypogonadism erectile dysfunction decreased libido gynecomastia and infertility and let me tell you men typically they do not develop galactoria right we have seen in females developing galactoria but the same will not be seen in men right so men they present with hypogonadism erectile dysfunction decreased libido gynecomastia and infertility then how do you diagnose prolactinoma and hyperprolactinemia let me tell you what will be the first line investigation first line investigation definitely you have to do prolactin levels but you should be able to differentiate the other causes for hyperprolactinemia before concluding it to be prolactinomas like always exclude the states such as pregnancy lactation hypothyroidism medication so all these have to be excluded before starting the workup of hyperprolactinemia and always remember prolactin it may be secreted along with the growth hormone that we call it as mammo somatotroph type of pituitary adenomas see mammo somatotroph type of pituitary adenomas means mammo is your prolactin somatotroph is your growth hormone so both of them they can get co secreted simultaneously in mammo somatotroph type of pituitary adenomas having said this what is the 
normal prolactin levels see normal prolactin levels is different in males different in non pregnant female different in pregnant female like if you see in men it is less than 20 nanograms per ml is the normal value whereas in non pregnant women less than 25 nanograms per ml is the normal value in non pregnant women whereas in pregnant women the normal value is around 80 to 400 nanograms per ml accordingly you have to suspect hyperprolactinemia like at what prolactin levels do you suspect prolactinoma when the prolactin levels are more than 100 that will suggest probable pituitary adenoma right that will suggest probable pituitary adenoma and the prolactin levels should be commensurate with the tumor size so prolactin 100 nanograms per ml correlate with the tumor of approximately 1 centimeter size whereas the prolactin of 200 nanograms per ml correlate with the tumor approximately of 2 centimeters in size so please remember this is very important point okay and again the same values you cannot apply in pregnancy because in pregnancy up to 400 nanograms per ml itself is a normal value so in a non pregnant female or in males these values are suggestive of prolactinoma and they almost correlate with the tumor size following that how do you manage prolactinoma so you have a first line management and what will you do in refractory cases so if you see in the first line management the drug of choice will be your bromocryptin or the cabergoline so this bromocryptin or cabergoline these are dopamine agonists they will reduce the prolactin levels right they will reduce the prolactin levels okay so dopamine always remember basic physiology is that dopamine will inhibit the prolactin release and your cabergoline or bromocryptin they are the dopamine agonists so they will inhibit the prolactin release and not only inhibit the prolactin release the cabergoline or bromocryptin even they reduce the size of the tumor that is what is being done by your cabergoline or bromocryptin then what is the efficacy of cabergoline remember about 90 percentage of patients treated with cabergoline they have a drop in prolactin to less than 10 percent of the pre-treatment level that is the efficacy of your cabergoline but if the question is asked what is the drug of choice for prolactinoma the answer should be bromocryptin all right next when is the surgery required in prolactinoma so definitely in those individuals who are refractory or who are not responding to your cabergoline or bromocryptin in those group of individuals surgical resection is being advised and particularly surgical resection is mostly advised in case of macroadenomas why because in macroadenomas you have the pressure effect on the surrounding structures that will be causing visual impairment because of the pressure effect on the optic chiasma so that is the reason why please remember those individuals not respond to medical management surgical resection is being 